Okay, today is a fun lecture. Let me just adjust the lights. On Plague, the Black Death, um, which is a very interesting topic. So let's talk about the Black Death. Uh, first, let's define pandemic since we are in the midst of a global pandemic. Um, pandemic actually means a specific thing. It's uh, epidemic of an infectious disease. And it means that it's spreading over a large area. And the reason I start this lecture with this definition is because some people misuse the term pandemic. So for instance, some people, and we've talked about Wolbachia in this class. So let me ask the question, is Wolbachia, the fact that it's spread itself in insects, is that a pandemic? No, it's not a pandemic, why? It's not an infectious disease. Okay, so I just wanna clarify that, point that out because um, it's kind of an important point. We're, today we're talking about an actual pandemic of, of plague. Okay, so there are, there are three, this is kind of a bad slide. There are three different pandemics of plague, okay? That are sort of like the historical plagues. And by plague, plague actually means, so plague has two definitions in a, in a general sense. It kind of means like pestilence but it also has a very specific sense when we're talking about like bubonic plague, like Yersinia pestis. So it means actually something very, very specific when I say plague in this lecture, it means bubonic plague. So there were three historical plagues that have happened under recorded history. So the first plague was in the sixth century and this was called the Justinian plague. So this was in just after Roman, after sort of the Roman Empire became the Christian Roman Empire. Um, Justinian was an emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and the first recorded plague occurred during the sixth century during his reign. That's what we call it, the Justinian plague. The emperor Justinian actually got the bubonic plague and he survived. So he actually got it. Um, and this plague, let's see if I have a. Any slides of it? Um, this is the slide of the first plague, the Justinian plague. So the air, the um, year is the year 541, and this is the Byzantine Empire. So if you know your history, the Roman Empire sort of became the Christian Roman Empire, which was then called the Byzantine Empire. Um, and it's estimated that 25. Will you close that door for me? It's estimated that 25 million people died during this plague. So this first plague, that was 13% of the, it's an estimate, but it was 13% of the known world population. The second plague, bubonic plague, was what they called at the time. So this was the medieval plague, which we call the Black Death. This is the plague that most people know about. In the time, they didn't call it the Black Death. They called it like the Great Pestilence or the Great Mortality. We call it the Black Death. This is the second plague in the medieval era and it killed about 30% um, of the population of Europe. Some cities saw like 50 to 100% death. So the death rate varied in terms of like your city, but there were literally some cities that literally like disappeared off the face of the earth because of the black death. And there were situations where like entire families completely wiped out by, by the black death. So that's what I have here. This is the second, the second plague, the black death. Uh, and we'll talk about we'll talk about these this imagery where this comes from in a second. So the history of the history of the Black Death, um, it's thought that it starts. So if you look at if you look at this map, this is a really interesting map 
um, and it by it color codes the spread of the plague by year. So the plague started in in Asia, in China, and slowly spread westward into Europe, up northward into Russia, and all throughout the Mediterranean. So it's thought that it came from came from Asia, and there's two sort of like ideas about how it spread. One idea is it spread on ships because ships carry rats and places like Istanbul in Turkey, Istanbul was like a big, like a big hub of like, um, what do you call it? Mercantilism, like trade. And so that's one thought is it spread on ships through rats. And the other thought is it spread sort of on land, again, in rats, but following sort of like the trade routes of like, I, I don't know if this is the year of like the Silk Road, but lots of trade came out of, came out of China, came out of Asia and moved westward. And people would travel these Silk Roads, these trade routes um, and pick up goods and then move them back and forth. And it's thought that that's another uh, feasible way through which this plague spread throughout um, the European, so those sort of like, I guess the Eastern and the European world. Okay. Oh, so I, I have this slide because I, uh, again, like I, if you know me, I'm an artist, I'm a printmaker, I like, um, I, I like really like woodcuts and woodcuts are sort of like an ancient art that came out right during the era of printmaking. And so one of the reasons I really like the, I guess, giving the Black Death lecture is because the Black Death at its peak coincides with the invention of the printing press. So the printing press, let's see, I have a note here. The printing press was invented in 1436. So again, if we look at this map, um, okay, so it, the plague predates, but even in the 1400s and the 1500s, like plague was still like occurring and, and the, the, the black death plague sort of because it killed so many people sort of like framed the mindset of all Europeans during that time. And so if you look at some of the earliest, if you look at some of the earliest like things that were printed coming out of the printing press, like the earliest mass printed books, what, what would you imagine those books would be? Like what were the first books that were printed in mass? The Bible. And so like the, the reason like Black Death has such a sort of a visual impact is because they were printing the earliest Bibles. And during that time, they, they were then of course obsessed with Black Death. And so they were printing very, very famous woodcuts focused on like the four horsemen and like pestilence and like plague. And you see a lot of uh, artistic themes that come out during this time. One is um, what we call memento mori, which is Latin, which translates, do you know what that translates to? It's essentially like remember that you're mortal or remember that you will die. So like after the black death, when everybody like died, people were sort of like obsessed with mortality and obsessed with death. So a lot of the imagery that comes out right after the Black Death, um, and, and again, like the printmaking imagery that and the art that comes out during this time is obsessed with like um, death, the, sort of the Grim Reaper, the apocalypse, things like that. And that is from the influence of Black Death. Um, here is another early Bible, um, illustration or woodcut actually. So again, same things, all the sort of imagery, the four horsemen, the, the memento mori themes, the dance of death themes that comes directly from, directly from influence of the black death. This is a very, I don't know why this is popping up. This is a very, very famous woodcut. Again, same theme. This is from Albert Durr. Um, and, and these themes came out of the black death. So I'm obsessed with this imagery. I, I like I like this imagery more and more. There's there's a whole bunch of these. But look if you look at if you look at if you look at art from the 14 1500s, like it's obsessed with this stuff. That's what survives. Okay. So before I go into this, the third plague. The third plague is what we call the modern plague. And that was an outbreak of bubonic plague in mid-1800s, I think 1855, 
in China. And it, during the, the modern plague, um, this was during the time when germ theory, again, like I've talked, we've talked a lot about scientific advancements in the late 1800s and sort of the obsession at that time is germ theory has sort of like been established. Um, Koch's postulates have been established. And so actually one of Koch's students, so Robert Koch, um, who is important in sort of bacterial infections and viral infections, establishing germ theory, one of his students, a Japanese, a Japanese student named Kidasato. This was the first person who actually like described the, the organism, which we now call Yersinia pestis. But at the time there was also uh, another researcher, researcher of Swiss, of French, Swiss ancestry, who also went to China and was researching the modern plague. And his name was Alexander Yersin. And his description of the plague was a little bit more robust and a little bit more accurate. So he gets credit for discovery of the organism, the pathogen that causes plague. And the organism is named what? Do we your, your Cyndia after Yersin, pestis. So again, another theme of where like a lot of people during these times were discovering the causative agent of these horrible diseases. And then they have the fortune of n having something so horrible named after them. Uh, okay. So, okay, again, before I go to this, um, people, plague is still around. So just the fact that I say there's three big outbreaks, it doesn't mean that plague is gone. Plague is still here and plague was there before these outbreaks and plague was there in between these outbreaks. These are just sort of like the worst case scenarios that have happened throughout history that's been recorded. But we still have plague around and people still do die of plague. Um, now it can be treated with antibiotics, fortunately. But like people still get it and you get it in, you find it in situations where there's lots of like, sometimes there's lots of homeless people um, or where there's um, sort of like communities of people who aren't, I don't want to say it's, I want to be careful about how I say, but it's, it's definitely associated with like people who in theory might not be taking good care of themselves. And so it's still around. It's still like a concern that we worry about in the modern day. Okay, so there is a big question. Knowing that I just told you like, oh, this one, the cause of this thing that happened in the sixth century was Yersinia pestis. The Black Death, the cause of the Black Death was Yersinia pestis. Three, the cause of the modern plague was Yersinia pestis. We know that the cause of modern plague was Yersinia pestis because that's where it was seen and characterized. But how can I possibly tell you that we know for sure the cause of one and two, the Black Death and the Justinian Plague was Yersinia pestis. How, how do we know that? How do we know they were plague? What would be your guess? One is symptoms, symptoms. So plague does something that no other disease does. It's totally unique, okay? And the symptom is called the buboes. So the buboes are swollen lymph nodes and usually they'll get them in the groin, in the armpit. Um, and it's essentially like you get this big round swollen lymph node. And of course, in that lymph node, what do you think is in there? It's the bacteria, it's like, it's pus. People, they would lice, they would lice these buboes and the stench would be so bad that the doctors would vomit on the spot is, is what the report is. So like these were nasty, but no other disease does this. This is totally unique to plague. Um, that's actually a really good hypothesis that it clogs up the lymph nodes. We bring that, bring that up again later when we, when I get to the reason, uh, when I get to a later molecular mechanism that I'm going to talk about, hold that thought. Um, but 
in the descriptions of the Justinian plague and the uh, Black Death, obviously these types of things are written down. And so we know in that sense that this was the cause. But that's not, that's not, I guess, the only thing that that might not actually be completely sufficient. How else might we be able to figure out what um, what the cause of those ancient diseases were? Yes. Okay. Well. Okay. Um, well, the question is. So it's a good thought. It's for sure gonna. You're gonna for sure gonna have antibodies. But the question is, how are you gonna measure antibodies from people who lived a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago? Like that's impossible. On what? Yes. Very good. Very good. So so what we can do is. Um, there's three different types of plague, and I'll talk about each one, but one of these is called septicemic plague. This is kind of like if you have bubonic plague and it gets real bad, it infects your blood, which is called septicemic plague. And the septicemic plague, when you get it, the plague bacteria actually gets in your teeth and it gets in your bones. So what they can do is modern science now, we can find, we can do what's called paleo microbiology. So we actually know, like we've actually like definitively proven that the pathogen of those plagues was Yersinia pestis. And the reason we know this is because we can find these mass burial sites of when people died with plague. There were so many people, there were literally so many dead bodies and plague kills you so fast. They, the descriptions are literally like in a week, like half the town was dead. And so what they would do is they would dig like a gigantic hole and they're just gigantic mass graves. So then when we find these graves, archaeologists or anthropologists can dig up these bones and we can actually do like ancient DNA extractions. So we can extract it actually like in terms of like ancient DNA, 600 years, a thousand years, that's actually not that, that's, that's not that long. I think people nowadays, I think you can do like DNA of like 20,000 years old, something like that. So this is actually not that hard. Um, and people can extract the DNA from the teeth and the bones. And then you can actually like they're getting to the point where they're actually literally like sequencing the genomes of the bacterial plagues and comparing the Justinian Yersinia sequence to like the Black Death sequence. So we know because we can PCR and we can find the DNA of Yersinia in the dental pulp of these people who were buried in these mass graves. And later you can actually you can actually also do um, LCMS MS, which is detecting protein. So we can detect their uh, genomic sequences, which still survive and the protein survives a little bit longer. So we can actually detect like outer membrane proteins and things like that from plague in, in the bones and in the teeth. So there's just really interesting like paleo microbiology that's associated with the plague. And that's the reason we know that those old plagues were in fact Yersinia pestis. Um, Okay, we talked about this. This is the modern epidemic. Um, these are some pictures of plague bacteria. So just more elaborate on the paleo microbiology. They actually have been given different names. So there's Yersinia pestis antigua, which is the Justinian plague. Yersinia, I don't know if these are after pestis. I'm assuming this is Yersinia pestis medievalis. So like a different strain, which is the Black Death, and then Yersinia pestis orientalis, which is modern. And we're beginning to understand the differences of these and, and potentially why different plagues might be different. Um, I guess there's some issues with these data. This is a controversial area of research. Obviously anything with like paleo molecular biology is gonna be controversial, but this is interesting. Okay. This is, let's talk now about these, these interesting so, outfits. These are the outfits that the plague doctors would wear um, when they treated the plague victims. And I have like a couple comments uh, about these outfits. Um, one thing is that like people like to use these as an example of sort of like dumb doctors or like pseudoscience. I don't think that's close to the truth. I think... I think this is actually like people being smart, being on the right track. Cause what they did is obviously, okay, what is, what is this thing? 
this is a cloak. It's covering their body. Okay, so that's going to be useful. Like we do that nowadays. That's not that weird. What's what's this? It's a mask. Like it's a mask. So I mean, it might look weird. And the reason it looks weird is because in this beak, they would fill. There would be a compartment, and they would fill the compartment with like things that smelled good, like incense and like things that were pleasant to smell. And the thought was that then the smell would like ward off this bad thing that was in the air. But in some sense, they're kind of right in a sense that like they knew it was airborne. And we're gonna talk about that. Plague does become airborne. It does become able to be spread by coughs. It's not just fleas. So humans were sort of like on the right track here. And I would bet that there was probably actually like some selection that essentially if you were a doctor and you were not wearing this, you probably died. And if you were a doctor and you were wearing this, you probably survived. So, yes, true. Although they probably wouldn't be treating anything other than plague at that point. Like it would be so, so uh, like prevalent. Um, so my comment about this is like, actually like they kind of got it right. Um, so we shouldn't really like make fun of the old people because they thought of this, like they actually kind of like got it right. And I'm actually kind of surprised at how like in some sense intellectual it was, although they might've not actually thought of it. It might've just sort of like came about through natural selection. Um, <laughs> that is kind of funny. Um, okay, so plague has three forms. There is bubonic plague, and this is the type of plague you get first if you get bit by a flea, okay? So you get bubonic plague if you get mechanical transmission from the flea. And we're gonna talk about how the flea transmits more towards the second half of the lecture, but there are other forms of transmission and there are other forms of plague. Um, if you get bubonic plague, here I have 30%. It's more like back then it was like 18%. So I've seen different estimates. It's like 18 to 50% chance of survival. So if you get bubonic plague, you essentially like flip a coin, you're dead. Um, that's kind of like the, your best odds. It's spread by fleas, which are telmophages. What are telmophages? Chewing. Yes, telmophages have like razors that will slice and cut the skin. There, all, there are, and it's important that you don't necessarily call them chewing because there are actually chewing like lice and that's, that's different. Yeah. Um, but they're razor blades. They, they lacerate your skin and they pool blood pools and then they suck it up. Okay, so the second form, so this is the first form, bubonic plague. And I will ask you about this on the test. I'll be like, oh, what are the different types of plague? Um, the second type of plague is septicemic plague, which we talked about. This is when it gets into your blood and you die. So the other, the other sort of symptoms of septicemic plague, and you see this in the literature and you see this in, the, in sort of like the modern art that deals with plague, I guess in movies and stuff, like the signs of the plague. Those would be like spots, like spotches and like rashes, almost like Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And that's because when it gets into your blood, what is it also destroying? Yeah, it's destroying your blood vessels and then your blood leaks out and you get these spots. So those are like the signs of the plague. That's septicemic plague. If you get septicemic plague, you're dead. Like you have 24 hours to live. Your, your chance of surviving is essentially 0%. So like if you get septicemic plague, you're dead. The final form, the third form is pneumonic plague. Pneumonic, so it's almost like the plague, like when you first get bubonic plague, it, it either like maybe you get goes to your blood or it goes to your lungs. Like um, maybe it makes a choice. I don't know if it's one or all or whichever one is more prominent, but if it goes to your lungs, which it can, it infects your lungs and then you get pneumonic plague, okay? And pneumonic plague, it essentially melts your lungs. You die in about maybe like two to four days and you essentially like drown in your own blood. So you're essentially like cannot breathe because your lungs are bleeding into themselves. Uh, it's a horrible way to go. And it's worse because what happens when it's pneumonic plague at that point? Well, it's the end stage if you get any of these forms. <laughs> but what? why also is like pneumonic plague much worse in sort of a societal sense than septicemic plague and bubonic plague? 
yes, now you're all of a sudden a super spreader and you're coughing it up to your family and you're spreading it and spitting it on your family. And plague goes airborne. And even if you die, if somebody comes near your body, they can inhale the pathogen and get plague. So if you get pneumonic plague, you're now like spreading it to everybody. It becomes, it, you, you are effectively aerosolizing the contagion. Hence the, the plague mask. Um, pneumonic plague is also about 100% kill rate. So essentially about a 0% chance to survive. If you get this, you die. <laughs> Unless you have antibiotics, which they didn't have back then. So the key takeaways are there's different types of plague, all the same pathogen, but different types, depending on what it infects. And there's also different modes of transmission. Okay, you can get it from a flea. And we'll talk about the different fleas that could potentially give it to you. You can get it from coughing. You can get it from like walking in contaminated air near people who have had plague. So you can get it in multiple forms and you can get it through multiple mechanisms. That's the take home. Okay, let's talk about the vector. The vector, the traditional vector are fleas, order Siphonaptera. Okay, um, what's the essence of a flea? What have you always learned about fleas? Even when you're a little kid, what? They, they, they jump, yeah. that's the essence of a flea. And if you ever read like kid books that talk about like, like, oh, the biggest animal or the longest snake, the flea is the animal that can jump the highest in relation to like its body size. So they're famous for like their ability to jump. Um, they're jumping blood suckers. Why would they jump? Yeah, so that's the other factor here is not, ecto, not all ectoparasites are alike. And we're going to talk about lice next when we talk about typhus. If lice fall off your body, they die. They die like within 24 hours. Fleas are not like that. Fleas, essentially, they can survive off the host and many of their life cycle, much of their life cycle is spent in the bedding of the host. So they're not reliant on clinging to the host, although they like to be on their host, but they, they're not, they don't need that. And so what's going to happen if you're in a house and you, there's a rat and the rat dies? What are the fleas that are on that rat going to do? They're going to jump, literally, pun intended, they're going to jump to a new host, which is probably going to be you. And then you're going to get whatever was carried around in that rat's bloodstream. So that's an important thing about rats. And because I like biochemistry, um, and this is a really good example to talk about like the importance of biochemistry. So what is it about fleas that allow them to jump? And also more, even, even more broader in insects, um, there is this protein, this unique protein called resolin. Okay, and this is in insects. Resolin is the protein that allows fleas to jump so high. Okay, and resolin in insects is put into things, it's not just in fleas, it's put into areas that essentially become hinges. So in like dragonflies, where would they load the resolin? Yeah, in the, in the dragonfly wing, in the hinge that's loaded with resolin. So in places where you want essentially like explosive energy and superb or super flexibility, stretchiness, you put in resolin. Resolin is actually known in biology as like literally the most elastic protein that's ever been described. So by elastic, I mean it can stretch and then it comes back together, okay? So resolin is a very famous example of this. Um, resolin can store great efficiency and energy and release it upon like an unloading. And the interesting thing about resolin biochemically, it's a repeat protein. What are repeat proteins? What? 
Oh, that's a good analogy. They're like paralogs. They're like, like if you were to take a segment and duplicate it, that would be in theory like a paralog, right? So they're just essentially like what we would call like duplicated domains. And there's two amino acids that pop up in resolin, which are glycine, repeats of glycine and repeats of proline. What's the unique thing about glycine for people who have taken my class? It, yeah, it allows free rotation. So you can see why they would put this in things that are hingy, things that want to be flexible. Um, what's the unique thing about proline? Yes, limited range of motion. It actually induces a bent, like a kink. Okay. And so by creating these, these sort of duplicated regions where they have free rotation and sort of like stiff bends, essentially what Resolin builds is it builds like a spring. It's essentially like, a, it's like a loaded spring. Um, what are springs famous for? Well, yeah, like jumping, but essentially, I guess more physically, it, it, they're, they're, they're famous for like loading kinetic energy or potential energy. There's actually like a famous like Hooke's law in physics where you can actually like calculate how much energy is stored in a spring yeah, based on, that. yeah, that's a classical physics example. <laughs> I remember doing that in my physics class too, which is why I talk about it. Your physics is useful. Um, Okay, yeah, but they're essentially like little springs, okay? And they load energy and then they can rapidly like fire it and that's how they jump. So if you look at the thing um, in the flea, in the region where the leg, the hind leg connects to the body, there's this little thing right here, which is blue. This is like a section of the, of the flea that's loaded with resolin. Here's actually, here's the actual repeat. You can see what it looks like. Um, there's these hairs and bristles what would these what would these be useful for these things these things what would these be useful for yeah to stay on the host it will jump into your fur and then because these are kind of like it's like a backwards hook it's it's evolved to like stick in amongst the fur these these cd cta cd um they're like hooks so just to finalize the general in a sense that unlike lice they can actually survive on different hosts and they will jump. Um, that's, that's sort of, uh, in some ways, that's a little bit unique to ectoparasites. Okay. The life cycle of the flea. It's, which term is it? Holometabolus, hopefully you guys know what that is now. Talked about it multiple times. Holometabolus, holometaboli is the full life cycle of metamorphosizing insects. So that means there's eggs. There's three instars of larvae and then the larvae pupate and the larvae are pretty, or the pupae are pretty. They form a silk cocoon. So silk is very common in insects, silk formation. And the pupae here form silk and then the adults pop out and the adults are hematophagous, so they all feed on blood. They will hang out in the, in the bedding. So fleas are unique in that um, not everything has fleas. Fleas are like evolved for mammals. Some birds have fleas, but they're kind of like evolved for mammals. Uh, I don't know if all mammals make nests and bedding, but I know like mice do, I know like rats do, humans do for sure. Yeah, dogs have bedding, but they, they will like have like a spot that they go to and like lay down in. I think that that might there, I mean, there's probably something to that with the evolution of fleas because what fleas will do is they'll, they'll jump onto the host to take their blood meal, but they won't stay on the host forever. When they get back to the bedding, they'll jump off and then they lay their eggs in the bedding and then the larvae and the pupae pupate in the bedding. And then when the adult comes out, it jumps back on the host and they can sense through like heat, like when the host is near and that's probably gonna be an impetus for jumping. Um, All 
I have a comment here. I don't quite know what it means, but I've read that fleas can like um, attenuate their development and their growth to coincide with when the host is present. So you would imagine like if you were sitting in your nice silk cocoon and your host was nowhere near, you probably wouldn't want to come out as an adult at that point. And so what they can do is they can sort of sense by the heat of when the organism is laying in the bedding. And that's probably when they want to come out at that point. Um, okay. So, and you, you will talk about this more as we go into more ectoparasites. Ectoparasites do, even, even the fleas become very, very specialized to their host and their taxonomy mirrors the taxonomy and evolution of the host that they live on. So there's a special species of human flea, which is called Pulex irritans, which has evolved to feed on humans. There is a cat flea, which is different from the dog flea, which is different from the rat flea. These are different species. Um, some are telmophages, not all are telmophages. Um, and I have here, some are solenophages. So their mouth parts can vary, but the ones that in spreading the plague, telmophages, rat flea, human flea, telmophages. Um, I, I talked about this with the Lyme disease lecture when my dog was like bringing in the ticks. This is a very common pattern that you see in vector biology is the animals that we live with in terms of both agriculture for zoonotic diseases and also the pets that we live with are very often uh, the cause of our diseases. It's happened to me. And this happens in the case of, you can get what's called cat scratch fever. Cat scratch fever is spreading of Bartonella bacteria from a cat flea. So cat flea would jump off a cat, get on you, bite you, you'll get Bartonella. So many of the animals that we live with get infections and spread them to us. I already said this. Okay. Um, I talk about this because this is in tandem. I say this point in both the flea lecture and the lice lecture. There's an interesting, in terms of like insect evolution, there are a branch of insects that I guess, I guess it would be like this. There would be a more ancestral branch and then there would be like a branching. So the, there's an ancestral branch that has no wings. And then there's a branch that developed wings, insect wings, okay? So fleas, if you look at them, where would they be? If I drew this branch, this is a trick question. If I drew this branch and I told you there's a bifurcation in the evolution of insects where some insects, the ancestral insects did not have wings and then some developed wings. And so my question is, if you look at the flea, where should they be in the evolutionary tree? Really? They don't have, so, okay, oh, okay, let me get my, so this is why it's a trick question. He said fleas should be here. They're not there. They're, they come from the line of insects that have wings. So they're unique, they're a unique case of insects that have lost wings. What? What? They do have the resolent. Well, they might have got it. That, that you're right. That may, it's possible that perhaps resolin was important for. That's a good hypothesis. Perhaps resolin was important for the evolution of insect wings. That's entirely true. And they do have resolin. But I think what you're saying is right in a sense that what I'm trying to say is they're not in the no wing clade, even though they have no wings. They come from the tree that had wings and they lost their wings. And if you look at them in development, they actually have like what are called wing nubs. And then the formation of the body actually like absorbs the wing nubs. So they have lost their wings. Why would they give up wings? Yeah, I mean, they don't really need them um, because 
do they ever want to fly like real far from their source of blood? No. So, and this is the same case with lice, body lice. Body lice are in the same situation where they're in this tree, they lost their wings, they sort of gave up their wings. And the reason they gave up their wings, both lice and fleas, is they sort of like found this island of like infinite food and they have no desire to leave that island and that island is your body. So, or a dog's body or a cat's body. So they sort of have like literally like lost functionality in their wings because they didn't need it. All they needed was the ability to jump and stay on this island. And then they're, they're sort of like safe. I don't know why it's doing. I think I accidentally hit the delete illustrator. Oh my God. So I have a picture here. This is the, the Faustian bargain. They, they gave up their souls. They gave up their wings for earthly pleasures. <laughs> um, okay, taxonomy of fleas. Like I never have you guys look at things to species because of weird things like this, like identifying insects to species. Um, it's complex. They essentially, everybody sort of like, you look at the, to tell the species, you look at their like uh, reproductive organs and they're super complex. They look like things like this and different morphologies of the reproductive organs sort of signify different species of flea. And it's important for how you tell one flea from another is you look at their reproductive organs. Um, I just show, I just say that in case, if there's ever a situation where you're like, oh, I need to identify what kind of flea this is. Maybe you, maybe you start there. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, here's an interesting question. I won't show you the next slide yet. How, how should you control for fleas? Like you find fleas in your house, what do you do? You dip yourself in hot water. That probably wouldn't kill them. What should you do? Knowing about that life cycle, what should you do? What? Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you clean up the bedding. So like if your dog gets fleas, like clean up the bedding, wash the bedding, vacuum. Sometimes you can treat with an insecticide if it's real bad, but in, in one sense, like, um, like if you get rid of the bedding area, you'll probably, and you clean up your house, you'll probably clear out most of the problem. Well, that would be, those are, those are dispersing insecticides. So you're saying like, how would that work? Like the collar, like the flea collar and the tick collar. Those are, those are dispersing chemicals that kill the flea. Yeah. Does that make sense? No, I think they literally like load those with chemicals and then they <laughs> like dispersing insect killing chemicals. Um, okay. Fleas are so interesting in, and, and Yersinia and plague is so interesting because there's a famous case of how um, a protein, another, another reason I like biochemistry, a protein can explain how a flea jumps. A protein can also explain much of the uh, pandemic nature of bubonic plague. So let's talk about that important protein, that bacterial operon. Um, okay, and it's within the context of bacterial aggregation. What is that? Aggregation. So this is with respect to Yersinia. What's bacterial aggregation? What sometimes, yeah, they stick together. They stick together. This sometimes happens when you're culturing E. coli. Sometimes you get like a, you seen this Lewis, you get like a big blob sometimes. That's bacterial aggregation. Sometimes they, they stick together. What would be mediating the fact that they stick together? Knowing what you know about bacteria and proteins. The what? 
Well, that would be like the signaling cascade that might lead to this, I think. I'm talking, yeah, it would be like the, it'd be like the outer membrane proteins and you said polysaccharides, which is really smart. What is it about, what's the essence of sugar? What is it? It's sticky, sugar is sticky. And so there are proteins in bacteria that can add sugar moieties to the outer membrane proteins and it makes the bacteria sticky and then they stick together. Okay, so a famous, the famous example of this is in the flea. In the flea, there's a flea gut, okay? And right before that gut is, I think what's called the crop. And between the crop and the gut is a valve. And that name of that valve is called the proventriculus. And what Yersinia does is really fascinatingly clever in terms of like evolutionary biology. What Yersinia does is this is the point um, of probably what you'd say smallest diameter in the flies or in the fleas elementary canal. And so what Yersinia does is it gets stuck in the proventriculus and then it starts upregulating glycosylating enzymes which glycosylate its outer membrane to form aggregates. So all of a sudden, what's going to happen if you form an aggregate of bacteria right there? What's going to happen to the flea? What? Well, it won't pop. It's a, it's a good thought. It won't pop. Why would you think it would pop? Because there's going to be an overload. Of what? Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. The bacteria aren't replicating so much that it's going to pop it. It's just blocking this valve. Is a f Okay, yes, that's, that's terminally. It's going to vomit. But also, too, um, is it going to be hungry or is it going to be full? Really? It's blocking its stomach. It's literally blocking access to the stomach. So it's going to get really hungry because... It can, it's going to be it's going to be biting and biting and biting and this blockage it's not going to be able to get blood into its gut so it's going to think like there's something wrong here so what's the flea going to do is it going to bite more or less it's going to bite more so the first thing that's going to happen because of this bacterial modification of its outer membrane proteins it's going to bite more and it's going to you said vomit it's going to vomit and what's it going to be vomiting up right on your body? Plague. So what happens is the, the bacteria has literally evolved to block the gut through aggregation. And the way that that happens is upregulation of, I think I have, this is the actual operon that's been studied in Yersinia that causes this. And it's called the HMS operon. Essentially, what you need to know in this operon, there are glycosyl transferases, which attack sticky sugar molecules to the outer membrane proteins. Then once that happens, the flea starts to feel like it's starving to death. So it's going to jump more, it's going to bite more, and it's going to vomit more, and then it spreads the pathogen. So Yersinia has actually like evolved by changing just one modification on its outer surface to spread itself in pandemic situations. Like to me, that's just like super fascinating. Um, and you can actually supposedly like, um, this is supposedly like a flea that has like healthy blood in there. And supposedly like when the blockage happens, you get these black fleas, which like, I, I don't know, something, something dries up or coagulates in there or something, but supposedly like the black flea is a sign that it's, um, it's clogged up. Okay, we gotta finish up soon. Biochemistry is cool. Okay, plague in America. Um, the literature suggests that plague was not in the US before 1901. 
Um, and it's thought that it was imported after the modern epidemic in China. And supposedly it was imported from Chinese seaports with pelts of Siberian marmots. I've never heard of what that is, or I don't know what they use these in for fur making, but supposedly this is a marmot and the fleas then carry the plague. And so if you're importing furs, you're gonna be importing fleas and then the fleas are gonna carry the plague. And then, and then now this is the modern distribution of plague in America. Okay, so what do you notice about the distribution? It's in the mountains, it's in the West, it's often in the deserts. It associates with rodents. So the reservoirs, there are, there are reservoirs of plague. Um, the common one in America are prairie dogs, which is interesting because everybody, when they go to the zoo, they love the prairie dogs. Don't ever go close to prairie dogs. Don't ever touch a dead body of a prairie dog. Don't ever go close to it. They carry plague. And um, there are famous examples of people who go and mess with prairie dogs and die from the plague. They're, they're not cute. They're pestilence bearing rodents. <laughs> well, yeah, that's smart. That's what I said. That's what I said. It's very common that the pets that you keep in your house are what transmit diseases to you. Um, it's in many cases unhealthy. And that's a part of why many people think agriculture is in some ways unhealthy. Um, but that's a separate discussion. So let me just see if there's anything else worth saying. Other things about it, it can lay the plague, Yersinia pestis, it can lay dormant in the soil for years. It's in rodents, it's in prairie dogs, it's in Arizona, Utah, New Mexico, Colorado. You can get it by, you can get it through various mechanisms. You can get it by inhaling air around like dead animals. If you go to a dead animal and they're fleas, they could jump on you and they could bite you that you can get it. You can get it by, if you go hunting, you kill an animal that has plague and you eat it. You can get, and you don't cook it properly, you can get plague. You can get it from animal scratches. So there are stories of people who fight like cougars and then, <laughs> and then they like get played. Um, don't, don't do that. Um, and this is actually an issue for, this is actually like, again, I like talking about this because this is irrelevant for people who study wildlife biology. Because wildlife biology, there's a famous example, um, this guy named Eric York. This was the, one of the most recent deaths of plague. He was a contract biologist. So he would go out if you needed to study mountain lions, you could contract him and he would go out and um, tranquilize the mountain lion and maybe like tag it or whatever, or track it or find it. And he was out in the, out in the wild and he tagged two mountain lions and he contracted pneumonic plague and he literally died in like 24 hours. So he was found dead, found to have been died with pneumonic plague. So if you're going out into the wild and you counter and you interact with animals, um, you are at risk of this. And maybe you want to carry some antibiotics or something. But this is like a serious thing and it does happen. It's kind of a sad story. Um, okay. There's also sort of a finishing up here. There's also sort of a question of which flea was the main vector of the historical pandemics. Like, was it the human flea? Was it the cat flea? Was it the rat flea? Was it the dog flea? The answer is probably, it was probably a mix of all of these things. Um, and there's also, I think there, I, I, going off the cuff here, you have to fact check me, but I think there's actually some data to even suggest that lice can transmit plague. So the, the fact that when the plagues were happening and were so rampant, it was probably many different things spreading the plague and not just fleas, bear in mind, but also like pneumonic coughing spreading the plague. Um, I don't know if anything is worth talking about. But in this sense, plague is, is a traditional, um, Murine, what is that? Mouse is like rodent, rodent zoonosis. So the, the rodents are the reservoirs of the plague and the, their fleas are a traditional vector of it. So if you get it nowadays, um, we can treat it. You can take antibiotics, you can take streptomycin. You can take, I think some people give gentamicin and I think some people give doxycycline. We can treat it now. And I do believe there's actually a plague vaccine now. 
So if you were working with wildlife biologists, maybe you want to get that. But that's the gist of the plague. Good time to end there. Uh, and then next, on Wednesday, we'll talk about lice, which are in some ways similar in a sense of their ectoparasites, and we'll talk about typhus. All right, good lecture. <laughs>